Cohen. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, hi, hi. Listen to this noise. Stop. There you go. All right. Testing three, two, one. Okay. And let me hear your beautiful sonorous vo voice. First um, trip to Boulder. Yeah. How are you finding the United States? You like our country? Totally. Ah. Welcome. Welcome. Most welcome. Uh, how come you don't have a first name? You're just a P. Ah. Uh, you know that Security. name comes... Security. Yes. Okay. I'm going to keep this if we get to... The U.S. Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay. We might uh, refer to it. And we may, I may go over some of the ground um, we just covered because, not to worry. That's fine. Okay. We are In fact, I'm, I'm interested in, the, in that Gandhi 9-11. That's a, such a good story. Okay, ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. This is David Barsamyan, and I'm very pleased to welcome P. Sainath. He's the rural affairs editor and award-winning journalist for The Hindu in Mumbai. He's the author of the bestseller Everybody Loves a Good Drought, Stories from India's poorest districts. Welcome to the program, P. Sainath. Thank you, David. Well, let's talk about 9-11, September 11th, which since 2001 is constantly intoned as a uh, mantra in the United States. There's another September 11th uh, in terms of the life and work of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, talk about that. What is it? Well, that's the it was also the 100th anniversary of that 9-11, which occurred in Johannesburg in South Africa in 1906. Mahatma Gandhi was then a practicing barrister in South Africa, representing in many cases the grievances and uh, issues of the Indian community there. The then South African government had passed extremely oppressive racist legislation that particularly hurt the community that he was representing at the time as a lawyer. And there was widespread discontent. Gandhi called, addressed a meeting on September 11, 1906 in Johannesburg, attended by 3,000 people or more, in which he propounded for the very first time, for the very first time, his doctrine of Satyagraha, the truth and power in, 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 in a non-violent form of resistance. That is to challenge the power of the empire without resorting to violence. It mystified many of his listeners in that period. I mean, the meetings went on before and after 9-11, but that was the crucial date on which they launched this doctrine of Satyagraha. Now, in, in subsequent years, the Mahatma himself was to recall this as one of the most crucial moments in his life. He wrote about it later, the South African Satya, Satyagraha in South Africa. You can find that online because all the works of Gandhi are now online and available to anyone for free, in which he says, this is the technique we subsequently used with such effect in India, in the non-cooperation movement, in the disobe civil disobedience movement, it's, it wasn't just used by Gandhi. Subsequently, it was used in South Africa by others. In the United States, it was used by Martin Luther King, who openly acknowledged his debt to the Satyagraha and nonviolent resistance of Mahatma Gandhi. So it played a role in your civil rights movement as well. The significance of it is that it set off a process in India that challenged the mightiest empire on earth and shook it to its foundations. Gandhi was a actually British trained uh, barrister who spent uh, many years uh, working in South Africa before he went to back, India. Back to India, where he later became uh, Mahatma. I think that was a, a, a title that the great poet Rabindranath Tagore uh, gave him. That's right. And 
but I, he, there's a continuity in what happens. Though his life changes in many ways, though his you know, views on many things change, Satyagraha, the 9-11 technique that he pioneered, gets honed finer and finer. So if you look at the three 9-11s that the world has seen in the past 100 years, New York 9-11-2001, Chile 9-11-1973. Explain what that was. Well, in 1973, when a, a coup against the elected democratic government of Salvador Allende took place in Chile, completely backed by the United States. In fact, you will find that for three years before that, the economy of Chile was had its back broken when President Nixon gave an order to his uh, gave gave an order to his CIA chief make the economy scream, and they did. They destroyed Chile's economy with the kind of assault that was launched on it in favor of corporate interests. In September 1973, 9/11, there was a coup against the democratically elected government of Allende. Three thousand people died in the first few days. 30,000 died, anywhere between 10 and 30,000 died in subsequent days, including some of the finest musicians, poets, writers of Chile, people like Victor Hara in uh, the stadium massacre that took place in Santiago. It was one of the bloodiest coups in Latin American history, if not the bloodiest coup. Today, you as a nation are investigating, to some extent, the crimes of General Pinochet, who was supported by the then American government, Cases are filed against him in the United Kingdom, in Spain, in Chile itself. But at that time, Chile was painted as this great success story. And what, a success story of what? Neoliberal economics, corporate dominance, the complete privatization of most services. These things happened in Chile at the time. So in many ways, Chile was the first of the neoliberal model stories. And it led to incredible bloodshed, to the dislocation, to the permanent uh, you know, migrations and diaspora of a lot of people from Chile. Of the three 9-11s, one actually changed the world for the better. It generated no hatred, no anger. You know, one can debate endlessly whether it would work everywhere. And you know, even I would say that that's an open question. But the fact is that of the three 9-11s, this had a much better impact, Mahatma Gandhi's 9-11. Everywhere you go in India today, you see uh, statues of Mahatma Gandhi in the center town squares of cities, and uh, he is greatly uh, honored and revered. What is his legacy beyond that kind of iconic status? See, I, I have a problem with, uh, you know, always looking back only to what was said in the 1920s and what he said during the civil disobedience movement or during the Quit India movement. I do not believe Gandhi was the only leader of the freedom struggle. If you're looking at statues and reverence, you would find there are far more statues in the villages of Baba Saheb Ambedkar, a PhD from Columbia University and the leader and a man who emerged from the untouchable classes of Indian society. The Dalits. The Dalits, exactly. In fact, the difference between Ambedkar and any other Indian leader is that the statues of Ambedkar are put up by public subscription, not by government fatwa, not by institutional order. Poor people make their own statues of Ambedkar. The freedom struggle of India threw up many, many leaders and luminaries of in enormous standing. For me, all these were part of that legacy. So I don't only narrow it down to Gandhi. I think that's wrong. I think that's incorrect. Uh, Many other leaders existed. Gandhi, of course, was the tallest of them. There's no question. However, I think that m many of the issues then, I would like to look at Gandhi and Ambedkar in terms of what would their stance or understanding of the present situation be? How would they act now? I think that's far more important for us. On, central, on some of the central issues of our time, caste, oppression of the uh, poorer caste and the so-called untouchables, I think history has proved Ambedkar to be right. I think Ambedkar's prognosis of the role that caste would play in democracy, of how economic lack of economic democracy would damage political democracy, was, I think that has been borne true by our subsequent history. I think that, yes, I think that every one of them is revered and should be for their role, 
but I would rather look at what would they be saying about today's issues. What would Gandhi say about the obscene inequality that you're looking at in the world? A man who said that for those who die of hunger, the only form in which God may dare appear is food. Yeah. So I, I think that's, that's the interesting thing for me. Where, what would they say today? How would you take forward some of the great things that they said and did? Your specialty is covering rural India. You spend much of your time reporting on uh, village life and, and what's going on. There have been severe economic and social repercussions in rural India since the so-called neoliberal um, economic agenda was introduced uh, in those areas. Can you put things in context and, and talk about what's going on? what you call the neoliberal era, the era of liberalization, globalization, and privatization, has been one of the most consciously cruel processes inflicted on the Indian poor. The kind of economic inequality, the obscene levels of inequality that are now existing and, and which we are still promoting, we have not seen these since the heyday of the colonial empire when we were enslaved and colonized by the British Empire. The kind of gaps that have come in Indian society are simply stunning. India today ranks 8th in the number of billionaires in the world, but we rank 127th in human development. India may be an emerging tiger economy, but Indians will the average Indian has a lower life expectancy than his or her counterparts in Bolivia, Mongolia, or Tajikistan. India may be this growing model economy, but our per capita GDP is less than that of Nicaragua, Vanuatu, or Indonesia. So for 2% of the population, the benchmarks are Western Europe, Australia, USA, Japan. For 40-50% of the population, the benchmarks are Sub-Saharan Africa. The inequality has grown tremendously. This was a consciously constructed process with a set of policies that have been enforced in many other countries and not just in India. These are the policies, the typical prescriptions of the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, and also of the elites of these third world countries, which are very happy to collaborate in this process of transferring huge resources from poor to rich. And this happens in the Indian context, whether it's the right-wing Hindu nationalist uh, Bhartiya Janta Party, the BJP, or the so-called moderate centrist uh, Congress Party, or is there a difference? The difference between the Congress Party and the BJP NDA has been more on the issue of communal and sectarian violence, inter-religious sectarian strife. Not on economic issues? Very, very marginally on economic issues. There's been total continuity. This process was launched in 1991 when the present Prime Minister was then Finance Minister. That's Manmohan Singh. Dr. Manmohan Singh, and the Prime Minister then was Mr. P. V. Narsimha Rao. Then the BJP came and took it further, took the process further, much further. Then the Congress comes back and again gets onto the same track. In 2004, people rejected these policies decisively. I think one of the proudest moments in Indian electoral democracy was when an electorate of 600 million people went out and showed the world what what electoral democracy means. It was a fantastic show of uh, voting that shook the nation, that destroyed the reputations of many polling agencies and pollsters and channels and pundits who predicted that the reforms were so popular that there was no question that the government would retain its hold. Instead, the darlings of the West, the darlings of Western corporations, the darlings of the United States took the biggest beating in the elections, like Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu in Andhra Pradesh, like Mr. Krishna in Karnataka, they took the biggest beating in the elections. Yet, on ha having come to power on their backs of rural outrage and even urban anger, the Congress government immediately sets about going back to business as usual. Same policies with one or two modifications because there's now a huge left presence in Parliament that forces them to do a couple of decent things like an employment guarantee program or a right to information act, these things. 
Talk about the characteristics, the actual programs of the neoliberal uh, agenda. Of, of, I think first and foremost, most people would recognize privatization of public sector entities. Well, there are five or six things which you can say have taken place everywhere in the world, including maybe the United States in some respects. But those mark out this set of this package or this direction of policy. One is huge cuts in public spending. Huge cuts in investment in anything to do with poor people, like in agriculture in India, followed by the withdrawal of the state, the withdrawal of the state from vital public services like health or education or literacy or transportation, followed by a massive wave of privatization, privatization of just about everything, including intellect and soul. So th then you have... The, uh, an increasing preference and bias given to corporations who are privileged over ordinary people. You have, you have food subsidies for poor people being slashed. You have the entire emphasis in resources and credit being given to the top 10% of society, abandoning the poor in many cases. I would argue that in many countries of the world, the process you're seeing is that the rich are seceding from the nation, leaving behind the rest of that country. So all these policies put together with more specific variations in different countries represent by, by and large the withdrawal of the state taking its hands off poor people and saying we are not responsible. You know, tough love or tough luck or whatever you want to call it. That process has characterized it. It means the diminution of government's role that governments should not exist. I mean corporations, you can call it free market fundamentalism. Essentially, that's, that's what it is. It's market fundamentalism. To my mind, the most dangerous form of fundamentalism in the world because it adds millions of recruits to the armies of the dispossessed in the religious fundamentalisms. So you're saying while on one hand India is experiencing so very high so-called growth rates, there is also a, a huge surge in inequality. Well, actually... There has been a huge surge in inequality in every sphere. Hunger, for instance, India added many more millions of people, hungry people in the 90s than any other country in the world. Indeed, if, the, if you read the Food and Agriculture Organization's reports of the United Nations, you will see that India alone between 97 and 2002 added more newly hungry people than the rest of the world put together. In the time we created our largest, eighth largest number of billionaires, in that same period, hunger rose in India while it fell in Ethiopia. In, in the period of the reforms or re um, free market reforms, the amount of food that Indian people, poor Indian people are eating has collapsed. The average rural family in India today consumes 100 kilograms of grain less than it did just five, six, seven years ago. The per capita availability of food grain, which is the food available per Indian, has collapsed in millions of tons, if you look at it. It's collapsed from 510 grams per Indian in 1991 to 437 grams last year, a year ago, which is a huge fall. And mind you, all these are averages. If you're looking at the bottom 40%, the compression of the diet of the poor has been cruel, brutal, and barbaric. In many of the accounts uh, of India in the uh, media today, uh, one finds this kind of juxtaposition. On one hand, you know, everyone is playing sitar and practicing yoga and they're vegetarians and they're, you know, pr practicing uh, meditation or uh, living a very uh, exalted kind of spiritual life. And then on the other hand, you have the um, India of, you know, Cyberabad, uh, the town in, in Andhra Pradesh, Hyderabad, which is a center of high-tech, infotech. Uh, Bangalore, we're hearing about these incredible uh, techno centers and Indian engineers so well trained at, at the many institutes of um, higher learning in India. But you're covering an India that's fallen through the cracks between those two kinds of uh, extreme generalizations. You know, it's true. And I'm saying that's the whole point. I, I reject the idea that there is an Indian reality. There are Indian realities. 
Both these are true. The, the process you are describing is very true of the top 5%, 3% of the population and to some extent extends to another 5% of the population. Let me put it to you in another way and you'll recognize it from your own experience of India. You've been visiting India for many years. It's only in the last 10 years that you have seen in all the metros that you visit a huge proliferation of weight loss clinics. Did you ever see one before the 1990s, David? Okay. Yeah. Now, India, each city has dozens and dozens, we don't know how many there are, weight loss clinics aimed at hide, helping the urban better off, the urban non-poor and rich shed the pounds they've acquired during the period of the last 10, 15 years. So here are your two Indias. On the one hand, you have a top 5, 10% of the population desperate to shed excess pounds. And you have hundreds of millions of other Indians desperate not to lose any more weight. So you have these guys going to weight loss centers, those guys trying to figure out how they don't lose any more weight because they've got to do severe physical labor in the fields. That's, that's one. At the one end of the spectrum, whenever you've visited India, I bet you've seen several cover stories about the new salaries of CEOs about young guys in their 20s earning more than mom and pop did in the last 40 years of their service. That's true. And it's for a minuscule, statistically negligible percentage of the population. At the other end of the spectrum are the real wages of agricultural laborers that have stagnated and even fallen in those years for the poorest people in the world. Okay, So both realities are true. You have, uh, oh yes, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, Brings out has brought out a report recently which shows you how hypocritical the stuff about labor efficiency is. In both Pakistan and India, during the period of the reforms, in both Pakistan and India, labor efficiency went up 84% in the reforms years. Labor efficiency went up, I repeat, 84% in the reforms years. And the real wages of the workers fell 22% as their efficiency rose. So you have the CEOs with these. Let me give you an example from the United States. Paul Krugman, when he wrote that brilliant essay, The Gilded Age, argued that obscene gaps between the top CEOs and the ordinary workers were a threat not only to economic well-being. Krugman very correctly argues that they are damaging to democracy itself. If you have people who are virtually your slaves, that's going to affect the mindset in which you operate with them. So you have Krugman's, uh, you know, saying that, look, the gap has gone beyond 100 to 1, maybe 1,000 to 1. In India, the gap is not 100 to 1 between the top earners and the lowest agricultural laborers. The gap is 30,000 to 1, 50,000 to 1, if you take the salaries of the top CEOs and those of the average Indian agricultural laborer hundreds of millions of them. One of the uh, shocking uh, phenomenon that's occurring in the Indian countryside, which you have been reporting on and chronicling now for many years, has been suicides among farmers. Uh, first of all, when did this start, and is it directly related to uh, economic policies coming from the central government and from the state governments? It is very, very largely policy-driven. It's also the reflection of what's happening in globalism. Okay? And even that is policy-driven. It really starts around the mid-90s in a minorish, in a small way, picks up by 98, 99, and by 2000, the suicides are raging. They are raging in particular regions which are most vulnerable. Those are regions by and large, by and large, not entirely, but by and large, regions dealing in cash crops, which have got linked to the volatility of global prices. They are regions where the safety nets have been removed by state and central governments for poor farmers. As the United States increases its subsidies for agriculture, our guys under the, under the influence of the World Bank and free market economics are removing the tiny safety nets and supports that Indian farmers had. So it's a process that has led to over, according to the government of India, over 100,000 farmers committed suicide between 93 and 2003. 
That's also a very misleading figure. In the first case, I call that a bogus figure. It's a huge underestimate. Second, but it, even by itself, it's an obscene number. Second, it doesn't take into account regional concentrations of the suicides, which is extremely high. Now, I'm coming out of Vidarbha. Where is that? It's in the western state of Maharashtra, of which Mumbai is the capital. Vidarbha, if you look at the state government's website, it will tell you that there have been 900 suicides in the past hour, in the past year. It will tell you that there have been 300 suicides in the past three months, which means, which means one every seven or eight hours. The phenomenon is demoralizing. It's dehumanizing. It's just terrible to watch this go on because I know that I'm covering people who need not have died, who were pushed over the edge by policy. One, the collapse of pu public investment in agriculture, which has been negative for some years. Two, the withdrawal of the state from the agricultural you know, scene in terms of assistance to farmers. The agricultural extension ministry is closed. The agricultural universities are acting as appendages of foreign multinational corporations and not of communities of farmers. They're not serving the farmers. Deregulation has meant that Monsanto could come and charge three times what it actually needed to on a bag of seed until it was pulled up by the courts and forced to reduce its price on seed bags to one third of what it was and it's still making a profit at that price. So anybody could walk in and rip off the farmer who was not getting a price on the market for his product though it becomes costlier and costlier to cultivate. So the indebtedness of the farmer has pushed thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of them over the edge into suicides. Explain how that indebtedness works now. Do, uh, with the closing of rural banks and financial assistance, uh, they're driven to money lenders who charge uh, usurious rates? Correct. This is entirely a policy-driven process. India was one of the pioneers of what we call social banking. India was one of the pioneers of what we call social banking. Social banking means the society, that society recognizes there are some areas from which you cannot expect profits in lending. You don't want to, you don't want to lose money. You don't want to lose money, but you're, you're not trying to make huge profits out of farmers or out of primary education or services for pregnant mothers. These are not things that you try making profits on. So in the social banking philosophy that India adopted when she nationalized the banking industry in the late 60s, a, a set amount, a, a significant amount of lending was done by the banks to farmers, to agriculture, recognizing that these are the people who place the food on your table, on the nation's table. Once we went into the brave new world of economic reforms, the banks stopped progressively, stopped lending money to farmers. So much so that something like 3,800 to 4,000 banks branches in rural India closed during the reform years, reflecting how serious the banks were about credit to the farmer. Now, what happened to the money that they took away from the farmer? That went, like in Latin America, like in Africa, elsewhere, it went to fueling the consumption and lifestyles of the top 10%. So it's the farmer could not buy a tractor except at 15% interest or above, at least 14.5%. But I can buy a Mercedes-Benz at 4% interest or 6% interest with no collateral. Huge resources were siphoned away. That, was, that happened from policy. So as this happened, farmers were turning more and more to private moneylenders. But the reforms process has brought a new, new classes, entirely new classes of moneylenders, not your old village Sahukar, not your old village money lender, who is actually cutting a very pathetic figure these days, but huge new money lenders in the form of input dealers, those who sell seed, those who sell pesticide. This guy is the king of the countryside. He is the salesman. He is the dealer. He is your agro scientist. He is the technical consultant to the farmer. He is also his money lender. You've done uh, quite a bit of research and reporting on uh, cotton. India, India has traditionally been uh, a great uh, grower and exporter of uh, cotton. What's been happening in that sector? It's a complete disaster, especially in the region that I was mentioning in Maharashtra, of which Mumbai is the capital. Cotton has, you see, one of the things is that in the late 90s, the European Union, and more particularly the United States, 
threw huge billions and billions of dollars into supporting their corporations that are cotton growers. I won't call them cotton farmers because these are businesses. These are not farmers. Now, what happens is that if you look in the 1990s, cotton prices were rather high in the mid-90s on the New York Cotton Exchange, you know, maybe about 90 to 110 cents a pound, something like that. I, I don't have the exact figure in my head. After 97, cotton prices start tumbling because the U.S. government is putting more subsidies into cotton for its corporations than the actual value of the cotton. Last year, USA's cotton crop was worth something like $3.9 billion, but you got subsidies of $4.7 billion. This went to 20,000 growers. You work out what it means per grower. So much so that cotton-based economies from Vidarbha in Maharashtra to cotton-based economies in West Africa, Burkina Faso, Mali, Benin, all these countries collapsed under the onslaught of these, of these subsidies. The EU, which has, doesn't have that much cotton growing, you know, you have pockets in Portugal, Spain and places like that, also got into the act. So the huge subsidies are, you're seeing farm suicides in Burkina Faso, in cotton growers. They are far more efficient. The Indian farmer is a million times more efficient in growing these things than your corporations. But how the heck, who the heck can fight against those kind of subsidies? Two of the presidents of these West African nations had a piece in the New York Times last year. Your subsidies are strangling our people. They explained it very clearly what these kind of subsidies were doing. Cotton is a mess also because of the promotion of technologies that are totally unsuitable to these regions, if they're suitable anywhere, I don't know, BT cotton, for instance. You know, it's what Monsanto has been promoting in Maharashtra. It is much costlier, much, much costlier to cultivate BT cotton than to cultivate hybrid cotton, let alone to cultivate organically. Okay? So the price input, the, the rise in price inputs has been astonishing because BT cotton used to cost three times more than a bag of, say, hybrid cotton. So you've had this huge rise in input costs, and people could charge anything they want because of deregulation of the markets. So that's the second place in which the EU and U.S. are implicated because of their companies and corporations dumping seeds at much higher costs at, at phenomenal scalping rates of uh, profit. Another key issue, of course, in India is a water talk about talk about that well i was interested to see your front page in the daily camera this morning talking about pepsi acquiring a company here in boulder in boulder yeah uh well pepsi and coke really made their first huge inroads into the indian market which was the fastest growing soft drinks market in the world anyway by buying out a lot of local companies and expanding their influence and power one of the problems, though, is that these are highly water-intensive industries in a country experiencing severe water stress. So their factories have shown up in rural areas, sunk God knows how many deep wells, mechanized wells, which drain away the water from the dug wells of the traditional farmers that don't run that deep. All over India, struggles and agitations and movements have broken out against Coca-Cola, against Pepsi or whichever the local soft drinks manufacturer is, they get, they get groundwater almost free. There is a place in Maharashtra where they were getting it for, f the soft drink companies were getting water at four paisa a liter. Now, as you know, David, it's not possible to translate four paisa into cents. It's, such, it's a negative amount, okay? It's maybe minus 10 cents or something like that. Then they shove this into a bottle, the only value added being plastic, and sell it for 12 bucks. So the looting of groundwater has been a major problem and therefore there is very, very strong tension and resentment against these corporations. Besides which, an Indian non-governmental organization, the Center for Economic, uh, for Environment and Science, the CSE, the Center for Science and Environment, had a report showing the presence of a high level of pesticide content in these uh, soft drinks. That led to a flurry of government actions. Different governments acted for different reasons. Many of them withdrew Coke and Pepsi from, you know, government institutions and, and banned them from educational institutions. In the southern state of Kerala, which you're familiar with, because of a whole series of clashes with Coke, the government there, the newly elected government there, 
actually banned Coca-Cola and Pepsi in the entire state, including production, distribution, everything. That ban has now been overturned by the High Court of that state. But the problem won't go away because the government says we will make legislation. This is an issue of water. It's an issue of survival. And everywhere, whether in near Varanasi in Uttar Pradesh, the largest of the state, most populous state in India, you have serious tensions over water. India is a water-stressed country. Many, polit many of India's most serious political problems are over water sharing. Now, as corporations come and take away millions and millions of liters of water from poor farmers who are as it is under severe stress for other reasons, then it's becoming a gigantic issue. And there's also, I believe, uh, water issues uh, with neighboring Bangladesh. Every one of our problems is in some way, it seems to me, linked to water. Our biggest problem with Bangladesh has always been over the waters of the Faraka Barrage. Our problem with Pakistan has often been over the Indus waters, okay? The Baglihar Dam in which the World Bank has appointed itself the empire, right? All our problems with Nepal are over the Kosi Barrage, which, which do cause a lot of distress to that country. So water is a very, very serious issue. I mean, you've had more than 30 years ago a, a vice president of the World Bank, 25 years ago, saying uh, you know, that the next century's wars will be fought over, on, over water. They already are. It does happen. So you're seeing a world... Uh, why is water so important? It's the last non-privatized resource left on, private Earth, on, on planet Earth. Okay? They've made a damn good shot at oxygen, too, at the Kyoto Protocols. If you look at it, I mean, you know, you can pay and you can pollute. But it's, as yet, a bit difficult to privatize oxygen. So water is the last resource left. It's a $200 billion plus a year industry, growing at the rate of 6 to 7% a year. And just four or five companies control this, like Suez, you know, uh, 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 Vivendi, Anglo Suez, all these kind of companies. By the way, in your neighboring Latin America, many of these companies have been physically eje ejected by populations infuriated over the privatization of water. In fact, one of the biggest companies in the world made a statement to Guardian, to the Guardian newspaper in UK a few months ago, saying, it's now impossible to work in Latin America and Africa. We are, t we are setting our sights on India and China. Uruguay had such a bad time, little Uruguay with about 3 million people or something, had such a bad time with privatization of water that they held a national referendum and became the first country in the world last year to pass a constitutional amendment banning the privatization of water. Water is the explosive issue. Water and energy are the giant issues of the coming five years. There was the case in Cochabamba in Bolivia where Bechtel privatized the water and there was a huge popular revolt and uh, the government was forced to uh, cancel the contract and uh, evict uh, Bechtel. Now, you just mentioned uh, energy. Uh, there's a notorious, uh, no longer existing Houston-based uh, energy company, Enron, which has had some um, contact uh, in India. Can you talk about the case of Enron? <laughs> Enron blew a hole the size of the Titanic in the economy of the richest state in the country, Maharashtra where all these other problems that we have been discussing are going on. Maharashtra had a state electricity board, which was one of only two state electricity boards in the whole country in 91 that was making, not only was solvent, but was making profits. Today, that state electricity board is in the red in billions of rupees, having been forced in it to get into a contract and a tie-up with Enron that destroyed it. Enron GE and Bechtel were the sponsors of a project called the Dabhol Power Corporation, the biggest white elephant that we ever inaugurated. It has caused such severe financial problems in the Maharashtra economy that it has led governments in search of fiscal stringency, which is what neoliberalism is about, to cut on a number of other programs, including midday meals for tribal children, for the children of indigenous people. The midday meals, which, as you know, are a major source of nutrition for poor children in India, all those programs have suffered because of the bankruptcy of the Maharashtra government. Supports to farmers have suffered. We're talking about thousands of billions of rupees going down the drain. And mind you, Enron remained a legitimate 
institution entity in India long after it was being chased by the FBI in the United States. It did the same in Argentina. It, it caused same similar damage in other parts of the world as well. The last 15-20 years, David, are best described as the period of the collapse of restraint on corpor corporate power. That's what it's about. You have a White House today with more CEOs in cabinet than anyone else, than at any other time in history, I believe. So that is it. It's about corporate power and the expansion of corporate profit. Uh, another U.S. corporation which uh, made its uh, mark in a negative way in India is Union Carbide in Bhopal in uh, central India, the capital city of Madhya Pradesh. Uh, there, has, there was in 1984 is what is described as the worst uh, industrial accident in history where thousands and thousands of people uh, were killed. Can you talk about that? In some ways, I think the Union Carbide gas disaster in Bhopal inaugurates the new era of corporate power. The number of people who died there were several times the number of people who died in 9-11. Okay? The decisions, every technical decision taken in Union Carbide was taken in the United States. The local administration of Union Carbide in India had to d implement whatever they were told. The New York Times' own investigative series on the subject shows you that, that all technical decisions were taken here. Where, is it Virginia, the corporate headquarters? Yeah. That's where the technical decisions were taken. Thousands of Indians paid for it with their lives. To this day, not a single person has been punished. Not a single person has spent a day in prison. Nothing. Nothing. But thousands of families have been destroyed forever. Uh, explain what happened for people who don't know. There was a, a gas leak. A this. gas leak of methyl isocyanate, you know, um, MIC, and a lethal gas escaped from from the... Union Carbide plant at the dead of night and floated across Bhopal in a deadly crowd killing in a cloud killing thousands of people and destroying the health and physique and you know everything of a lot of others uh, the number of victims was understated at first it was said 1000 then it was said 2000 then it was said 3000 we know that something like 20,000 people died there whole hospitals have had to come up to deal with the problems of the survivors who got a pittance as the Indian government of the time entered into a rotten deal with Union Carbide that gave them something that amounted, amounted to a few hundred rupees per person or a few thousand rupees per person. So essentially, a corporation killed 20,000 people and got away with it. It also destroyed the lives of about a few hundred thousand others. But it got away with it. Nobody paid the price. Nobody paid a penalty. And as I said... That's about six times or seven times the number of people who died in 9-11. Talk more about uh, the power sector, I mean energy sector uh, in India. Um, when I go there, there are brownouts and, uh, and you, know, you have diminishing uh, capacity. People buy generators to supply uh, power. Yes. Uh, actually, the power situation is extremely serious. One of the things is that we stopped investing in the public sector quite a long time ago. And we thought that the comings of the Enrons and the others would make up for the withdrawal of those kind of investments. That's not happened. Very little additional electricity has been generated and people are paying higher and higher and higher prices for that which is, for extremely poor services. Besides, we've crippled the state electricity boards even those which were profitable, and all of them were not profitable, some of them were in losses, but the losses now are a lot bigger and many banks are holding the baby. So the destruction in the power sector has been tremendous. Second, there's a huge class bias in the distribution of power. You know, if you live in the rich areas of Delhi, you won't know too much of the problem, but even they are beginning to face it now. In the villages, they're quite, you know, people are saying, people comment on it when they have power for eight hours. They say, okay, today we got some power. It's, ha it's damaged farming very badly because power is being diverted. What little power the farmers had is being diverted to industrial units. And uh, more and more institutions, even hospitals in the countryside, are struggling for power every day. So the energy crisis, the electricity crisis is very serious. And the rates, by the way, the rates that... Uh, Enron brought to 
um, to Maharashtra, where the highest rates for industrial users in the world, we and Indians were paying higher rates than Californians. This acute distress, which you have been documenting in the Indian countryside for many years now, also leads to a mass internal migration. Uh, the population of cities like uh, your home city of Chennai or Kolkata or Delhi or Mumbai have simply skyrocketed. It's, in fact, a gigantic displacement. I keep saying India is witnessing the biggest displacement in her history and we are not noticing. It's not coming from one dam. It's not coming from a mining project. It's not coming from some development project. It's coming from the destruction of agriculture primarily, but also from other sources. Millions of people are moving towards the cities in search of jobs that are not there because we've closed down manufacturing units by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands in the cities. So they end up there as daily wages, menial laborers, domestic servants, and the infrastructures of the cities obviously are, are unable to take them. If you look at the United Nations Habitat report, the challenge of global slums, this is a worldwide process. The UN report predicts that by 2030, which is what, 24 years from now, a third of all humanity will live in urban slums. A third of urban humanity already lives in slums, but it will be a third of humanity. And the biggest areas of these slums will be India and Africa. So that's where we are headed. The internal migrations are pushing people towards cities the, and, and, not, and to smaller towns as well and to other villages as well. Where do they go? We have destroyed agriculture without providing them any option or alternative for absorption of their labor. There was much organization and resistance to World Bank big dam projects in central and western India along in the Narmada uh, Valley region. Uh, that has, was kind of celebrated here as a great victory. Uh, the people, the mostly Adavasis, the indigenous people, were able to stop some of these uh, big dam projects. Uh, what, is that an accurate description of what happened? And did that inspire other movements in India or was it a, just a one-off? There is no doubt that the struggle against the Narmada uh, projects was a major inspiration for a number of other movements fighting similarly. What's happened, though, as you might know, is that the Supreme Court ruling has gone against, a, a ru recent ruling of, the ruling of the Supreme Court of India has gone against the oppositionists, ag against those fighting the dam. I think it's a very, very regressive ruling, I think it's a very bad decision on the part of the Supreme Court. It is really going to hurt a lot of people and set a very bad precedent for similar struggles against displacement across the country. But understand this, the Indian, in, and the courts are also part of this, the Indian middle and upper middle classes are sold on this idea of techno fix, that technology and engineering can answer every problem in the world. Oh, we've got a problem with water? Let's interlink 37 rivers. For God's sake, it took millions of years for those rivers to work out their own courses, and our engineers are going to set them right in, you know, in a couple of decades. It's insane, but the idea that somehow you can control nature to that extent with engineering. The dam, in Nar whether, the, whether it's the networks of dams on the Narmada or anywhere else, many of these have proved and will prove disastrous. There's a much bigger one than Narmada coming up in Andhra Pradesh. It's called the Polavaram Dam Project. It's going to it's going to submerge over 300. It's going to submerge 300 villages almost, and that's what the government accepts. It doesn't speak about a number of other places which are going to be uh, affected. It's going to destroy a very large number of nomadic communities that live along the river and move with the flow of the Godavari River. So you, we are we're not out of that framework yet. We are still obsessed with this techno-fix solution rather than look at issues of equity in water sharing, look at issues of priority in water sharing. Why should there be hundreds of water amusement theme parks in India drawing on water in high-stress areas away from drinking and farming? Spending billions of liters of water probably each year 
in 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 operating these uh, amusement parks and water theme parks well, in the western state of Rajasthan which is virtually a desert uh, there are golf courses that's right in fact there was a plan once to start golf courses as a as a food for work program in Rajasthan which shot which got shot down after we did a story in the hindu one eh? the average golf course takes between 1.8 to 2.3 million liters of water a day in a season imagine as you know if you know rajasthan and you know it well it's it's a desert state in many respects you know on that amount of water the people of many villages could live through the entire summer season instead of which you're going to turn it into for golf golf also has this additional problem of extraordinary usage of pesticides so you're having fights and you're having shooting matches in philippines for instance between golf course owners and farmers as the one the drainage of water the draining of water from the farmers too in return for taking their water you give them pesticides that seep down into the water uh, into the aquifer so you're having you know incredible problems of pesticides getting into the and uh, in, into the food chain into the water chain in a very adverse way for the farmers neighbor whose plots neighbor the uh, golf courses what are the points of resistance to these uh, neoliberal policies uh, we've talked about uh, some boycotts of coke and pepsi uh, initiated by state governments not from new delhi not from the center uh, some resistance in narmada to big dams but what else is going uh, on around around the country for example there's um, a highly publicized uh, uh, militia movement in uh, central and eastern india do you give that much credence see let me put it this way um uh, i think there are far more interesting and far bigger things happening than the naxalite movement which you are referring to the naxalites basically had a big base in parts of old bihar and jharkhand and in andhra pradesh what's happened is that successive andhra governments have su- have very substantially damaged them so badly that they have fled into neighboring states and therefore there seems to be a spurt of activity in those neighboring states some of these states privately their intelligence reports do not give much importance to the size or scope of these militants in public the governments make a huge thing about them because it's good for governments to keep exaggerating the threat that people face you know and then you can build your national security or state security apparatus you can arm yourself to the teeth you can pass regressive and repressive laws suspending civil liberties like they have done in chatisgarh using this as an excuse it is nowhere really at a stage where you need to do that or suspend civil liberties or anything of the sort in fact doing that doing that is very very counterproductive in regions where oppression of the peasantry is already high and therefore you will always find that some militant movements will have bases in the peasantry however small or however modest it's going to happen as long as the oppression exists but let's move to something i think far more optimistic i look at the world today i see a restless and unquiet world everywhere anywhere you know americans may be first noticed the protest during the violence of seattle i was i was thinking at the time where do you guys live there have been a thousand seattles in india in latin america in africa in other parts of asia long before you guys had seattle people were out battling against privatization against unfair trade on the streets of delhi mumbai kolkata in the villages the rallies of farmers that was happening long before but i'm very pleased that seattle happened i think it's a good thing it gives it gave people an idea that something was fundamentally wrong i think it's a very restless world and if you look at the wave of changes in latin america suppressed and held down for so long if you look at the fact that your armies of spin doctors sent out to defeat evo morales could not pull it off in bolivia in bolivia, in bolivia, yeah. in bolivia. if you look at the fact that all the attempts including coups and what not have flopped in venezuela all these show you that you know the world is a stubborn place and it's not willing to be kicked around so easily it kicks back so there's huge changes taking place this huge resistance taking place in india i see it every day it's the farmer suicides is a form of protest and a very negative one it's a sad thing but there are also movements of farmers 
there are farmers taking on the governments in various places when their land is being forcibly acquired for some corporation. There's a, there is resistance. The trick will be how do you tie these different streams of resistance together? How do you use that energy on, on a common program that benefits ordinary people? India had a reputation for an independent foreign policy, um, a major player and participant in the non-aligned movement, uh, particularly during the years uh, right after independence when Pandit Nehru was the prime minister from 1947 until his death in 1964. What's going on now with, what trends do you see now in Indian foreign policy? Can I just take a moment to say something about resistance? I would say that India once again in 2004 showed the world what democratic resistance was about when 600 million people went out and threw out the governments that implemented these classic neoliberal policies. That would be the BJP government? The BJP-led NDA government, but also in several states. That was at the central level, at the federal level. But also, Congress governments that followed similar policies were no less smashed in their state governments. So there is resistance. By the public has shown its distaste, its contempt for these policies. But it goes on. on. The foreign policy issue. I think that, you know, one of the... I think that you're right. India's stature has eroded considerably in the non, in, amongst poor, poorer nations, which once looked up to India as the leader. You know, long before you had your disinvestment movement in apartheid, and your movement was somewhat hypocritical, You'd made your money for 40 years and then a company could say, you know, we think there's something wrong in South Africa. We shouldn't be investing here. Having made tens of billions of dollars out of black slave labor, you could then afford to discover your morals. India, right one year before independence, 1946 under Pandit Nehru, closed down its relations with South Africa in protest against racism there. It hurt a very poor country like India. We lost between 5 and 10% of our total external trade. But you know what? I'm extremely proud of the old Indian passport. The first passport in the world that said all countries except Republic of South Africa. Okay? So that was the kind of, that was the kind of foreign policy that gave India stature. If you ask Nelson Mandela which country he looked to, he will not tell you United States or UK. He will tell you he looked to India in the years that he was in prison. He knew that India would represent that case of, of the South African people. You will find this in many parts of the world, how people were influenced by the freedom struggle generation of India. The last 15 years have, been, have seen significant departures from India's independent standing as a leader amongst what was called the non-aligned world. Now we are aligned. The, whether it's on the Iraq war or on, on the disputes with Iran, we are invariably on the side of, I won't say on the side of America, I will say on the side of the most conservative sections of the American establishment. That's where we are as a nation in foreign policy. But India didn't send troops to Iraq. Not for want of trying. The Indian government of the time, the BJP government of the time, was fully willing to send troops. I think the deputy prime minister, when he visited the United States, even struck a verbal deal that he would send troops. But the Indian public would have none of it. India has millions of people working, at least one and a half million people working legally and probably an equal number working illegally in the Gulf. Imagine what would happen to all those families if there was a war there. And in any case, why do we want to fight someone else's wars? You know, as, as Muhammad Ali said so famously, I ain't got no quarrel with the Viet Cong. Yeah. What We have had excellent relations in these past decades with the people of Iran, with the people of Iraq. Mm -hmm. And we nearly got into dragged into a war that wasn't ours. And uh, we have a sordid history, by the way, in, in Iraq, as, Indian 90, as thousands of Indian troops died fighting for British imperialism in that country when it was called Mesopotamia during Dur the First World War. Mm. So there was huge public resistance. And the parliament of India maybe became the only one to actually criticize the war. So that move to send troops was completely overcome. And incidentally, still, in the name of some projects or excuses or the others, a few civilian workers have been encouraged to go to Afghanistan, where they are in serious trouble. 
we read about their kidnappings and their killings every now and then. So on an official level, the uh, BJP government at that time in October of 2001 uh, did not support the U.S. attack on Afghanistan? It could not. Its own cadres were against getting into the war. And it tried, it, it tried its best to, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm not, oh, you're talking about Afghanistan. Well, it, it tried its best to get into the coalition of the willing from whenever that was formed for Iraq. It did not criticize officially in any strong way any of the actions of the U.S. government in a direct way. It was the parliament of the country that had a, you know, a resolution saying that the war is a wrong thing and this is not the way to settle an issue. On Iraq. On Iraq. What about Afghanistan? I think they waffled. I mean, because you see, the, the embrace of the United States was... Ne they were getting into the embrace of the United States and also they were trying to break out of their isolation on the nuclear blast that India set off in 1998 under that BJP government. So there was this tacit kind of, well, you know, we, we think you should not do this, however... You know, we understand that there are problems. And, and in the post-9-11 thing, none of this meant anything. The U.S. was going in there anyway. In March 2006, George W. Bush visited New Delhi, and there he negotiated what's been called a very controversial deal uh, with India. India is not a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Nevertheless, it has weapons of mass destruction. Uh, w what's the comment on that d deal from your perspective? There is a significant amount of resistance and resentment against this deal in the Indian public. Secondly, it's interesting that the strands of uh, the strands of discontent come from very different parts of the spectrum. Several of India's top nuclear scientists are totally opposed to it. They think it takes away their independence, it takes away, it curbs their freedom, it curbs their rights and in, in, in their, their direction and their program. But another section just wonder why are we getting into this at all? Why are we getting into this embrace? You know, why are we getting into this situation in the first place? And there's also the section that has all along thought that the nuclear blasts were a bad idea, as I do. Okay. So you do have a lot of, but it's also seen as part of the overall Indo-US embrace. And that makes, say, the left extremely unhappy with it, worried about what's happening. And we don't know because there's no transparency to much of these negotiations. We don't know what has been conceded in return for what. Talk about the media in India. You work for the Hindu. Uh, what's going on in, in terms, of course, in the United States, as you well know, there's been enormous concentration of me media monopoly control. Five corporations basically control what most Americans see, hear, and read. Do you have those that kind of thing going on in India as well? It's a very rapidly developing situation. First, I should say that the Indian media at its worst has a far richer spectrum of political opinion than the U.S. media. I'm talking about the mainstream, not at all about the rich alternative media. So you can you have a better spectrum of political opinion in the Indian media also because it's such a heterogeneous society. And you have giant media in, ten la in 13 languages and 10 scripts, okay, apart from what you have on television. However, the concentration you're speaking of is growing very fast. And yes, Murdoch is there too. So are many others, and their influence and their power grows by the day. The concentration of media in India is taking place without even the restrictions on cross-ownership that other societies have, have had. So you also have a gigantic trivialization process on in the media. The farm suicides is a very good example. The day the farm suicides crossed 500 in Vidarbha region in a record period of time, the Lakme India Fashion Week was going on in Bombay. The India Fashion Week, as it's now called. Okay. It was quite, you know, Kafkaesque. There were 500 plus, maybe 512 accredited journalists covering the Fashion Week. Okay. There were less than six journalists from outside Vidarbha covering the suicide deaths of 500 farmers. And it, there is a connection between that Fashion Week and the farmers. The models walking the ramp in the Fashion Week in Mumbai were exhibiting 
cotton garments the guys who made the cotton were committing suicide one hours flight away but the media didn't get the story according in my understanding the fundamental feature of mass media in in our times is the growing disconnect between mass media on the one hand and mass reality on the other and it's increasingly and painfully true of india as well india today is a popular mass based uh, magazine did it cover the or does it cover what's happening in the rural areas very marginally very marginally and only when there is some major explosion or event or so so i mean if you took if you gave it a comparison on how much is given to say covering fashion and the glitterata and compared that with the agrarian crisis the latter would be negligible what can people in the united states do in terms of forging links of solidarity with uh, rural india i think it's a process of self education in the first instance but lots of interesting things are happening i think it's a process of self education because whenever i'm speaking in the united states i'm finding that people are shocked to know who gets their agricultural subsidies okay that it's the beautiful people and the corporations that get it and not their struggling farmers in iowa or minnesota people are really genuinely shocked to learn this second they're shocked to learn what kind of things this achieves in the third world so i think that something about what about the power of corporations and the damage they're doing to people's lives in the united states and abroad is something that you know people in the united states need to ponder on how do you how do you create that common ground after all corporations have also destroyed small holder farming in this country so how do you create that common ground there's an history and a memory here so that i think is a very significant area on taming the power of the corporations that's an area where american activists have some experience and can work very well with those in india and even in people to people movements secondly i must say that in several universities in the united states there were lots of sympathetic actions to poor farmers in kerala and uttar pradesh fighting against coca cola on the issue of water activists in this country managed to get a few universities i think to stop selling these products boycotts and things i think it was a significant psychological support if nothing else but it it also raises local level consciousness here so i think that there's any number of areas in which people can cooperate one i think they should i mean for another matter the policies of the world bank which are driven by the interests of the united states and a few other western countries year after year they create incredible damage i think there should be more discussion on whose interests these institutions represent do they represent the interests of the american people i think not they represent the interests of the most powerful corporations in the world so i think there's a lot of self education to be done and a lot of activism to follow in your spare time when you're not reporting on of the crises in well, uh, rural, rural India uh, you somehow managed to actually teach journalism and i'm interested that one of your courses is called covering deprivation talk about that well covering deprivation you know uh, is actually a course divide, devised by the faculty of the asian college of journalism it's a leading school of journalism in chennai in the headquarters of the hindu and the school is closely connected to the hindu in some ways the thinking of the people who started that particular course it's a core course and a compulsory course is that if you want to be a journalist in india you have to know something about deprivation you know you will cover other things anyway but you need to know something about this so whether you're going into broadcast or online journalism or print journalism it's a compulsory core course covering deprivation i do a module uh, because i'm the guy who covers these things in the field so but we also bring several modules in that course which bring some of literally some of the country's finest economists on agricultural labor on poor people on poverty some of some very fine sociologists it's a it's a course with many kinds of inputs and mine is one of those here's a tough investigative question what is the p in p sinath and why don't you use your first name uh, well actually it stands for palagumi it's just it, it people find it very hard to pronounce palagumi it's yeah, easy well, uh <laughs> well you should see some of the instances that i have in mind but palagumi was is the vil- name of a now non-existent village in andhra pradesh um it's you know 
in India and my part of the country, and this causes confusion each time I fly in the United States, we write our, f- in, in our part of India, we write our family or village name first and our own name second. So Sainath is really my first name or what you guys call Christian name. Palagumi is my surname. And yet it would be wrong to call me Sainath Palagumi. So my byline just goes as P. Sainath. Uh, my granddad used to tell me that Palagumi was a village that was... Uh, it, it, it falls in an area in the Godavari side where, you know, in Kakinada and that around those areas, which were always a hotbed of revolt against one empire after the other, and particularly against the British Empire. So the Brits once raised to the ground a number of villages in that area which no longer exist a bad idea it spread us all over the countryside to foment rebellion and revolt P. Sainath is the rural affairs editor and award winning journalist for the Hindu thanks very much for your time thanks David my pleasure I'm David Barsamian thank you for listening <laughs>